on this rap ish. I ain't even broke a sweat, homie. This practice, pondering my next move, staring at my track list. Hope I ain't missing my window. Praying like a Baptist, Seattle's own. Tired of this game of thrones. They made a list of the best rappers, and guess who wasn't on? Why the disrespect continues? I'm steady packing these venues. Guess if you ain't at the table, you on the menu, and I'm next bitter, baby. They don't want you to see, but everybody's south to Capitol Hill's rocking with me. Boys smoke the trays and ponder getting their life together. I'm comfortable with my role, so I'm like, whatever. Me? I ain't got a job, but I work hard. And you? You don't work hard, but you got a job. The irony is I'm judged while you feel the applause. I'm slept on, that's why I had to set this alarm. My dudes is armed, I'm armed with this arm charm. Body banging like she got that cream from Barry Bonds. Yeah. I did it for the city, I did it for the love, I did it for the people, I did it for us. X-ray season is here, a real hitter with a mic, I'm everything that they fear. With that hood ain't the same, I was all on their ass, I'm level headed. So yo, my dudes love when I spaz, and I'm so over Seattle's passive aggressive attitude. They don't call you back, what they really saying is F you. While I'm from the same place, I move at a different pace. I prefer if you just said it to my face, damn, I did it. I did it for the city, I did it for the love, I did it for the people, I did it I for us. average dudes with they average fit, writing average rhymes, knocking average shit. The closer I get, I can feel the people starting to shift. I'm loyal to a fault, and everybody can't come with. Rap's a rich man's game, I'm only playing with chains. They bang models and singers, I'm knocking my own flame, I'm different. The crowd, I move with the chosen few. Black thoughts, I could be the front man for the roots. No diamonds and gold, I'm on my sticks and stones. If we can see your panty line, you should have on a thong. My team is strong, through this fire we forged the bomb. And they already know what it is when I get on to the hearse. Party like it's December 31st. When I'm on my deathbed, I'm probably cracking my nurse. You ain't got the bars to compete. I'm a verbal athlete, deflating these boys so they say that I cheat. Damn, I did it. I did it for the city. I did it for the love. I did it for the people. I did it for us. Yeah. I should probably start by apologizing for the long wait, man. You know, I know I be tripping. But I'm not just a rapper, I'm an artist and, You know, my creative process is a little bit different than most Nonetheless, I want to welcome everybody out to the Dre's experience I got TCF in the building, my whole camp's here with me I got the band in here laying this cool-ass vibe And I'm Seattle's own Let's get into it I just wanna leave God protect me I just wanna live I just wanna live Hey, hey, happy Friday Eve. Happy Thursday to all y'all out there. Welcome to the Morning Update Show. I am your co-host, Trey Holiday. And you know what? We have a, another great show for all of y'all today. I started my day off right, nice and right, and it's nice and bright out there. Hope y'all are enjoying this sunlight as much as I am. And, you know, I'm the one who gets to really enjoy my co-host energy every day. What's up, Big O? Good morning, Trey Holiday. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. How are you, my Fa friend? Fantastic. I see my my the um, we're matching kind of. I know. The, the, I know. The color here is matching the earrings. Hey, shout out to Allison Fine for these earrings. She she found me some dope ones. Shout out to the Mariners Team Store. Hey. <laughs> Got me a great one here. All right. Good morning, everybody. Want to welcome you to the morning update show and remind you that right now is the perfect time for you to tag and share the stream. Go ahead and tag and share the stream with people who you feel would appreciate culturally relevant news and information emanating from right here in the Emerald City. Want to give a big shout out to our partners over at the South Seattle Emerald as well as KBCS 91.3 over at Bellevue College. Man, we're, we're going to move quick today. I'll let you know. I'm going through like an auctioneer. We got two really big guests here today. We have King County Prosecutor Dan Satterberg, and also we have State Senator Joe Wynn, who's running for the seat of King County Executive, and talking to both of them about gun violence. You know what? It is an issue that we have kept our finger on the pulse of for a really long time. I'm so glad that they'll both be here to give us their perspective on this issue that's really affecting all of us within the city and county. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, want to remind everybody that you can listen to the Morning Update Show anywhere that you listen to your favorite podcast. Right here, we've got SoundCloud, but you can also find us on where Google. Apple, iTunes, Spotify, just search for Converge Media Network and you'll find it there. Election Day's coming up, Trey Holiday. Yeah. And you know over here at Converge, our message to the politicians is no excuses. A great way to support Black-owned independent media while letting people know how you feel is to go to whereweconverge.com forward slash shop and you can pick up a No Excuses t-shirt or a No Excuses sweatshirt, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Great quality and definitely a great message. All right. We saw this was a big deal yesterday. We saw Governor Governor Inslee come out and they're talking about these, these variants and some of everything else. This is the part of the show we always remind people that the uh, vaccine is readily available in King County. And we're going to put a link in the comments right there. If you want to go and get vaccinated, uh, I think the mayor said yesterday, Seattle is about 80%. It's the Seattle. I'm not sure what the county is at. But if you want to go and get vaccinated, you click the link right there. Most locations you can get, uh, I say you can get all three. You can choose one of three. But we said yesterday, the way these variants are going, you might need all three. But uh, the vaccine is free and readily available. If someone asks you to cash app or Venmo them for uh, the vaccine, just say no. Yeah, don't pay them. <laughs> don't do none of that, man. Get it for free. <laughs> yeah. And, and also in the city of Seattle, in some parts of King County, man, people will come to your house and vaccinate you. And that's also free, too. So somebody's like, yeah, I'll come to the crib. So he's <laughs> <laughs> so he's somebody. All right. Uh, this is a part of the, uh, of the show right here where we remind you that we have a campaign here. We're trying to get Jake to 10,000. Believable, man. He's the best player in the world. I'm glad he's on my side. And going into a game seven, you want the best player in the world on your side. The backyard got mountains in it. I do not move until my accountant finish. Yeah. Big racing jars, each one an ounce. That's right. We're trying to get the big fella to 10,000. If you're not following him yet, Trey, tell them where they need to go to follow Jay. <laughs> hey, make sure you guys are following walk.into.the.light so you can get some amazing imagery and videos from our guy, Jake. And yeah, you're right, man. Just let's help him get to that 10,000 mark, man. Yeah, I was saying, you know, our, our, our viewers and, and listeners out there, they're always very supportive of things. And if you enjoy the photography, if you go to the, the Converge Instagram or a lot of our different platforms, man, you know, Jake Gravbrot is our visual storyteller here. So, you know, make sure you follow him there on Instagram. Also, wanted wanted to bring this up. We've updated our vaccine um, stories right there on the blog. So we've got a new one from Asia. Um, also, Inye Dinesh is still up there. And what we're what we're doing here is we're giving people space, Trey Holiday. I mean, clearly, you know, there's a big push in messaging for, for people to get vaccinated, vaccinated. You know, in our community and other communities uh, across the city and, and country, there's hesitancy for a lot of different reasons. And I'm not talking about the anti-vaxxers. Anti-vaxxers are clearly anti-vaxxers. There's people that are hesitant about a lot of stuff, and we want to continue to have a conversation. You know, one thing I hate is is where people, people, I think they don't understand how they lose people. If they're just like, you do this, do this, do this, do this now, and they're, they're not leaving space for discussion and for people for understanding and information. Yeah, I don't think any of this should be about shaming on either side, right? right. I think, you know, if, if you feel comfortable to get the vaccine, great. If you don't, great. Nobody should be pressuring you in any direction. You know, some of you had to do it for your jobs. Some of you had to do it for families. But ultimately, you know, to put that that opinion out on other people like, hey, well, you ain't doing it. Shame on you. Or, oh, you did it. You're a sheep. You know, like all of that is is nonsense, man. I'm glad that we're having these hesitancy talks. Trey Holiday, what you just described is politics in Seattle. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's exactly it's, it's so extreme here on the political field in Seattle. If you did this, then you're all bad. If you did this, it's whatever. And it's like, yo, and, and you see that's it's totally extended to the vaccine and some of everything else, man. I think that uh it might be a sign here. The election season's coming up, people are going to the ballots, man. It might be a sign here to, to really be like Whose messaging is actually sincere? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Converge is thriving because of, of we're intentional about 
creating space, about having space here to be able to entertain a different point of view. There's all kinds of people that I disagree with, but I still want to understand. And unfortunately, here in the political space, we have a lot of people who don't even leave space for understanding. You know what I'm saying? There's people, I can tell you, I disagree with them, but I understand everything about their argument and why it makes sense to them. So, uh, man, this is pretty serious here. Going up, up in Shoreline, Shoreline, um, Black Coffee Northwest. Um, we didn't have a the video didn't make it into the show this morning, but Black Coffee Northwest vandalized again. Yeah. You know, I saw this and, you know, somebody was saying, man, this has really got to stop. You know, it looks like somebody broke their window, one of their windows, the lower uh, window of the shop. And this is something that they've been dealing with since before they even opened. When we talk about, you know, racism being alive and well, um, they're they're continuing to deal with it. Yet, you know, what I really appreciate about all the folks that are involved in the shop and the owners is that they're staying resilient. You know, they're not uh, falling to these pressures of racism to move or, you know, close their shop down, man, kudos to you guys. We're sending you strength because we know you need it. And as a, a black person um, in Washington state, I just want to say, I am proud that you guys are standing firm out there in Shoreline. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, Shoreline has, it has a history and, you know, it's, it's not fair to, to, implicate a whole city or things like that. But, you know, that's where Edwin T. Pratt was assassinated. Uh, nine, nine months, I think, after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, Edwin T. Pratt was one of um, Seattle's, I think it's classified as a civil rights assassination. It happened up there in Shoreline. Um, you know, that's when the Central District was, was very much redlined right here. And Edwin T. Pratt um, decided he wanted to move his family there to Shoreline. And he moved there, the very first black people to live in Shoreline, and he was assassinated, killed on his front porch with his children watching and his wife inside. You know, and Edwin T. Pratt right here from, the, you know, the Central District. And that's why Pratt Parks on Jackson Street, you got all this stuff named after Edwin T. Pratt. So us guys here who grew up in the Central District, you always keep Shoreline in the back of your mind because as a little kid, that's a story that we, you know, that you learned about was Edwin T. Pratt being assassinated there in Shoreline. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And this is why it's always important for us to make that historical connection and bring in the context of a deeper discussion. Because when we talk about uprooting, you know, the facets of racism, it it's expands so far beyond and wide in terms of our timeline. And right here in Seattle, this progressive nature that we seem to have, you know, honestly, there's still acts of racism happening. And so we really do have to bring them up and make sure that they're spotlighted because that's the only way that we're going to eradicate it, though. Yeah, and we're gonna see if we can we can get a hold of them up there. I mean, maybe we can take a ride up. Yeah, you know, I'm see, down. And see what's going on. This right here, I'm not gonna get into too much of this today because I don't know a lot of details, but I do want to let our viewers and listeners know this on the radar. This is um they're having a second rally here for uh Tirhas uh Tefasayan um was was killed there or died, killed, whatever the word is, in the, the uh, Linwood jail. Um, and like I said, there's been these rallies that are going on and people are trying to bring awareness around it. And clearly it's working. We're here talking about it. You know me, I always like to get more details on things so I can speak to things in an informed manner. But um, but yeah, this is people are coming out up there to Linwood. And, you know, I mean, they're saying there's a lot of foul play and a lot of things don't add up. And like I said, I want to dig deeper into the facts and be able to report back here to everybody. But want to let everybody know it's on our radar. Yeah, it definitely is. And I'm glad that we're mentioning today, um, even though you guys know we need to get more facts on this. And there's some folks that I know that are on the ground helping to organize some of these rallies. We'll be in touch and try to bring some more information on this story, because once again, here we are. We may have a tragedy, it seems like, on our hands, though. Yeah, I mean, people are really rallying around this issue, you know. Um, they're, they're, they're activating around it, so we're going to stay on top of it. Got one more thing here but, uh, before we go to break, and we'll come back with Prosecutor Satterberg. It's, it's a throwback Thursday. It's a little bit of a sad story, but, man, it's about a life well lived. You know, um, Ike Everard spoke with Stephanie Johnson Tolliver at the Black Heritage Society of the State of Washington, and, and really, we at Converge here wanted to honor 
um, the life of Jacqueline E. A. Lawson. Do we have a motion graphic here? Seattle's black community suffers a loss with the passing of Jacqueline E. A. Lawson, but her legacy lives on in perpetuity. And that's from Ike Everard there. So Jacqueline Lawson was the co-founder of the Black Heritage Society of the State of Washington back in 1977, um, just passed away at the age of 93 years old. You know, it's an old African proverb that says that when an elder, when an elder dies, it's like a library burning to the ground. But, you know, the amazing thing about um, Jacqueline Lawson's life is that her life's work continues when the BHS and, you know, interesting story. Her great grandfather was one of the founding members of First AME Church. First AME Church is the oldest black church in the state of Washington, actually precedes the state of Washington uh, by three years in its founding. And man, her whole life and career was all about black history and genealogy and, and some of everything else, man. You know, I was, it's a, a big loss for our community. And, you know, we, we, a lot of our elders, we know very well known. This was somebody the average person probably had never heard of, but her contribution was massive. Yeah. And when you talk about folks knowing her in the black community, it is definitely uh, a life that is known to so many. And when we think about the impact of starting such a vigorous um, institution in, in the black heritage society, we see Stephanie Johnson, Tolliver S J T continuing in the legacy of Jacqueline. And honestly, it's a beautiful, thing to be able to have such an amazing legacy to stand on. She really set a foundation that is like no other. And so uh, we are sending so much love to the family. 93 years old, we can all only hope that, you know, we get up in, in age like that so that we can actually experience our legacies and experience all the energy that we poured out there as Jacqueline did, man. Definitely a life well lived. And if the if the link isn't in the comments, they're putting it in there right now so you can read this article. And man, this this Ike Everard is just he's just coming along, man. Firing him out. You know what I'm saying? We've only got him here for a week before he goes back to Arizona State University. We're gonna take a break right now. When we come back, we're gonna be talking to King County prosecutor Satterberg about this gun violence occurring in King County. You're watching the morning update show. The Morning Update show is going back on the road, and this time we're headed to Seattle's iconic Paramount Theater. Join me, Trey Holiday, and the rest of the Morning Update show crew August 2nd through August 6th as we broadcast live from one of Seattle's most iconic landmarks and put a focus on the arts, culture, and music right here in the Emerald City. That's the Morning Update show live from the Paramount Theater, August 2nd through August 6th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., streaming across all Converge Media platforms. Market Street Shoes, slinging kicks since 2006 with styles that support you and yours getting the F outside or staying comfy when you just want to lounge indoors as well. But wait, Market Street Shoes is way more than just a shoe store. Gear up for your next outdoor adventure with apparel and accessories that'll have you looking good on the streets, the trail, or even in your own backyard. With locations in Ballard, Redmond, and online at MarketStreetShoes.com, there's undoubtedly a style and size that'll fit your lifestyle. What's good, everybody? It's your boy, Cuddy, and it's about that time of year. It's time to get out and vote. This year, we're weighing in on local races from the county executive to the mayor to the school board and more. So now's the time to use your voice and make yourself heard. Read your voters pamphlet. You can make your selection in any color pin, sign your return envelope, and return your ballot as soon as possible. Be sure to track it through the process at kingcounty.gov forward slash election. Ballots must be postmarked by election day, August 3rd, or placed in one of the 73 King County Dropbox locations by 8 p.m. on election day. Look, now from one P to another, it's important that our verses is heard. So please, go out and vote. All right, welcome back to the Morning Update Show. That's our director, Cuddy, right there. You know what I'm saying? Been after it. Now he's doing commercial. Pretty soon he's going to replace me. Uh -oh. Please make it sooner, than, <laughs> rather sooner than later. Curtis Delgado, please bring in King County Prosecutor Dan Satterberg. Hello, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 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 Welcome. To the morning update show thanks for having me yeah it's, it's good to be here uh this is actually uh prosecutor Staterberg's first time with us live yeah. we've done some pre-recorded stuff so it's first time live next time we gotta get you in the studio though 
uh, that'll be a good good thing when we start to get out and do more in, stu in studio things. But yeah, it's good to be with you. And I'm sorry to be reporting on, on such a, a negative story. Well, you know, it's an important story. When we tighten it up, there we go. It's an important story to be talking about what's going on here. And actually, unfortunately, the last time that we talked was about this very same issue. Um, you know, and let's uh, well before we before we jump into the actual the um, the information that you guys put out there to the public, man. Why don't you tell us like what's going on? Well, what is going on, and there's a lot of remarkable things happening um, in the criminal justice system right now, uh, but while we're digging out from a pandemic-related uh, backlog and while we have a, a whole lot of new uh, work to do to resentence people uh, for crimes that they were convicted of, and you know, we had the, the drug uh, statute thrown out by the uh, Supreme Court back in March, that's 50 years worth of convictions that we are undoing, and uh, in addition to some other cases that we're resentencing. So there's a lot going on, but what's really going on in the community that we're tracking, and we have been tracking for now for the last four and a half years, is a, a, a really disturbing rise in the incidence of gun violence and gun homicides as well. So the reason my office keeps track of this is that we're sort of the, the one place that can be the, the repository from about 40 different law enforcement agencies that we work with. Uh, and so we have kind of a baseline going back to 2017 about, you know, what so-called normal gun violence was pre-pandemic. And then last year, uh, when we started to get into this lockdown, about a year ago, we saw a rise in gun violence. And then that has continued um, in a disturbing fashion through 2021. So uh, when we compare uh, the, the we, we, we count these things, we count the number of incidents where a gun has been used. And that could be a car or a house gets shot up or a street sign or something. And we can recover casings from a scene like that all the way up to people being shot and hit. And, and then those that die and then those that do not die, all those are different categories that we keep track of. <clears throat> what we know from the first half of 2021 is that um, our, our incidence of, of just any sort of gun being used is up by 33%. The incident of someone being struck by a bullet is up 60 percent number of people being killed by guns is up by 50 percent over this four and a half year average right so let's let's jump into some of these um some of these slides here the first one that we have is shots fired so yeah there that that will tell you that compared to the numbers we've been keeping since 2017 uh we're seeing far more incidents of shots fired that's up a third uh the number of people hit is up over 60% and number of people killed over 48%. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of our, our top line data that we keep, but we also track where it's happening and 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 then we have other information that we don't share in, involving, you know, who who is more likely to be involved. So it, it's speaking of, and I know Trey, Trey wants to jump in here in a second, but when you said where it's happening, I wanna put up the second slide here, which is the, the areas, the geography. So you can see it's happening everywhere, but um, most of it is now not happening in the city of Seattle. 64% uh, of the shots fired, it's almost 60% of the people who were hit are, are happening outside of the city limits of Seattle. We've seen uh, you know, the, the migration of violence into the suburbs uh, over the last uh, four or five years. Yeah. And, it, you know, when you get data like this and you're able to kind of map it out and showcase really what's going on, what are some of the biggest takeaways from your office thus far in terms of those first two slides we just showed? Well, just that we we've had this sense that there's a lot more gun violence out there and this confirms that. Uh, and within my office, I have a team of, of deputy prosecutors who respond to every uh, homicide scene. So anytime uh, the police uh, uh, find some a dead body uh, or there's a shooting and somebody might die, then we, we go out to that and, and it could be any time, day or night. Typically we do about 90 of those a year. Uh, we call it, it's, it's my, the team's called MDOP, the most dangerous offender project. Typically 90 uh, call outs, we call them every year where the police will call us because they've discovered a, a deceased person. Well, last year we had 146 and in the first half of this year, we had 90 and we've had eight in the last five days. 
So it's, you know, the, it, there's a lot more violence uh, and we, we measure it um, in terms of the workload on our, our people, but, we, but that's really a callous way to do it. We know that every time somebody is shot, uh, it's a terrible tragedy and, and that there's ripples of grief. Their life may be forever changed. I mean, we, we shouldn't discount people who are just injured by guns because that can be a devastating, life-changing injury. And of course, anytime someone is killed, there's ripples of grief that go throughout the community. So I, I, I have to stop and, and acknowledge this is not just a workload issue. This is a human tragedy. This is trauma that's rippling through our community. And every time one of these happens, it seems like there's, there's some sort of act of retaliatory violence. Well, that creates even more exponential suffering. You know, it's really good to hear you say that, uh, Prosecutor Satterberg, that you, you mentioned these ripples and the ripples of grief and everything else. Um, you know, sometimes in our fair city here, uh, we 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 uh, get a lack of empathy or a lack of understanding from people in leadership positions that, you know, it's, of course, the victim and the victim's family. But it's a lot of times the whole community or neighborhood or people who witnessed, I witnessed yeah. it these horrible acts they're they're impacted um so we've got a historical data slide here we'll put up right now so this this just shows you uh the number of shots fired on on the left of the screen and then the number of shooting victims so they're both up in the first half of 2021 uh and up quite a lot uh and so then the question sometimes comes well why I don't know that I have the answer to why um, there it's complicated. It's I'll say this, it's happening all over the United States. Uh, we are seeing more and more violence in every major city and even in rural areas as well. Uh, obviously the availability of firearms uh, is a key part of this. It just, anytime you've got more guns and we've in every year we've seen record numbers of gun sales and uh, you know, anytime you have them in, in the area, it can take an angry confrontation and make it a deadly confrontation. Uh, if one or more people in, in, involved have a gun on them. And, and so often we see somebody pull out a gun in, a, in the middle of an angry confrontation thinking, if I pull out a gun, that'll calm everything down. Well, obviously it has the opposite. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of uh, shoot. I mean, what, what, what I've noticed is a lot of shootouts. And, you know, I mean, uh, growing up here back in the day, a lot of stuff with guns was was one way and you're right. Somebody would pull out a gun, somebody say gun, everybody runs, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but we see like up, up there on Capitol Hill on um, on Pike and Broadway, there was a shootout 20, you know, 25 show people. People are shooting at each other, right. um, which is which is is crazy. Um, one more slide here. And I know that, Trey, we got a few more questions for you. But this one is a breakdown of race. And this sadly is not news. This is a pretty consistent uh, demographic breakout where um, we've seen for the last four and a half years that we've been keeping these statistics. Obviously, this is a guy thing. 85% of the people who were shot were men um, and mostly young men under the age of 24 and people of color uh, and particularly black African-American victims are, uh, represent half of the people who were shot in the last six months in King County. So this is uh, shows the high concentration of deadly gun violence within communities of color. Yeah, this is, you know, something that I think is uh, really felt by families. And when you talk about this being, you know, really a human issue, it's clear that, you know, many families are the ones dealing with this. Um, you know, in terms of, of your role in all of this, you know, understanding these numbers, and I appreciate your, your first answer to my question. Now, when you start to break it down by race, um, what does that mean or how does that change it? Because we also know that there's been kind of a history of, you know, black folks getting the hammer slammed at them when it comes to these kind of things. How are you guys looking at it from an equitable lens? Well, that's a great question. And, and it, it, it does fall disproportionately upon young people, young men of color. And I, I think that one strategy that is called out for is to invest in the kind of violence interruption uh, programs that we know have worked around the country. And we have some people in our community. We're lucky to have people who run programs like Community Passageways and Choose 180 and others who are willing to work with young people uh, who are attracted to violence. And, you know, they're, they're, they're have, they have to battle this thought that some young people in our community have because they live in violent areas. That they think, I can't leave the house unless I have a gun with me because there are people out to shoot me. And that's not an irrational thought for some people in some 
uh, situations, but it does lead to the use of more guns and, and you know, the, the, the sort of cycle, endless cycle of retaliation when one group shoots at another group. So the violence interrupters and the investment in these, these really, we call them credible messengers, people who have a lot more credibility than I do or some judge. It's somebody who's had lived experience who can can surround a young person and say, you know, there's more that you can do with your life and we're going to work with you get to get a job or maybe to move out of this neighborhood to a different neighborhood or we'll show you some new experiences. But it's about developing trusted relationships between adults and young people where then they can start to move them away from the thought that they have to have a gun with them all the time. Right. And maybe you could you could do this, sir is you could explain them. Well, last time I talked to you, you talked about why the investment, we talked about Choose 180 um, last time we talked, but you, you you talked about why investment was important because this isn't just like a social work job, these these violence disruptors and programs. I mean, and I think uh, paraphrasing at the time, it's like, this is dangerous work what people are doing. Um, and when I, when I talked to Derek Wheeler Smith, a ZYD, and Coach uh, Davis from Community Passageways. Um, you know, one of the main things that they were hitting on is that this is also a form of public safety. I only bring that up because I think, like the, the general public, when they hear peacekeepers and they hear credible messengers, they're kind of thinking like, "Oh, are these kind of just some social work people?" Not disregarding that industry, of course, but maybe you can speak more to this role and why investment, clearly that you're behind, is important. And these investments in, the, in both the city and the county announced uh, a $2 million new investment in uh, the groups that are willing to work with young people who are uh, most likely to be involved in violence. And it's hard. You know, most most groups, boys and girls clubs love them, but they don't want to work with kids with guns. And, you know, it, it takes an individual relationship that's built uh, between the, the credible messenger and the individual. And one of the things that we do with the information that comes to my office that we don't, we don't release all of it publicly because some of it is about individuals who happen to be in and around scenes where people are being shot and maybe they haven't been shot yet or maybe they haven't been charged with a crime yet but they are they are in and around the scenes uh and we do something called the social network analysis so we know if your friend's been shot you know if you know someone who's been shot you're much more likely to be shot yourself so if you're in and around that violence we th those names bubble up into our database we share those names with the violence interrupter uh, groups that are willing to do this work. And not to say that you have to report back to us on anything. We just say, here's the names of some people who we think statistically uh, are likely to be caught up in violence. Go work with them. And don't we don't want you to report back to us on anything, but we just want to tell you who we think it would be used, you know, worth targeting as a, as a resource, as a positive role model in their life to try to, to change the the direction that they seem to be headed in. So these are, this is really hard work. It has to be targeted to the people who are most likely to be involved in violence for it to have any impact. Uh, and it's not going to be successful all the time, but it is definitely worth doing and it's definitely worth investing. in. Yeah, absolutely. It is. And, and, you know, one of the graphics that we showed just uh, now also really showcased how this violence is erupting all throughout the city, throughout the county. Uh, what are some of the things that you think we can do to ensure that folks who think this isn't their issue, right, that it's not hitting their doorstep or the propensity of it to hit their doorstep? What are some of the things that you think we can actually do to make sure that they begin to care about this issue and really see it as a public health crisis? Well, it, it, getting people to care about it when it is concentrated in communities of poverty and communities of, of you know of color that you know that is something that um, these statistics are designed to help people understand this is our issue. And some people are moved by the humanity and moved by the fact these are young people; these are our kids who are ended up shot and killed. Uh, others may be moved by the fact that there's an economic price, right? We all pay a huge price for gunshot victims, whether you live or die. Uh, there, there's enormous financial expenses that, that go. And if we can prevent a homicide, um, and the studies show that we save millions of dollars uh, for every homicide that's prevented. So some people are moved by the economic arguments, others just by the fact that these are you know, our kids here in King County, Washington. Uh, you know, this is a big problem all over the country. I want to stress that. But it isn't enough to say, well, then we shouldn't worry about it because this happens everywhere. It's happening right here in our neighborhoods and those bullets are flying and innocent people get hit too. And, uh, you know, we just shouldn't tolerate an, an, an increase in gun violence as okay or normal or a, 
you know, consequence of the pandemic. Frankly, it's a consequence of the pandemic. I didn't anticipate that we would see so much more violence, but I think violence is at, the, at its core, it is an emotional response to despair. And so we have to be able to surround the people who are most likely to, to, to think that violence will help them get out of the, the desperate situation they're in and give them some other al alternatives. It has to not just be all, all carrot, you know, it has to be some, I mean, it can't just be all stick, it has to be some carrot. You have to say, we're gonna help you get out of this because we're gonna help you get a job and we're gonna help you move into a better neighborhood or we're gonna, we're gonna show you, even some, you know, some of these uh, targeted groups, they'll even, they'll take young people out hiking in the mountains. They've never been there. They've never been out of their neighborhood. So, you know, establish trust relationships with adults. That is a, a, a proven uh, approach to this. And it's something that we have to invest in the community. Only the community can bring that sort of justice to the streets. Right. One, one last uh, question for you. All right. I'll throw this out here. I, I appreciate you going over time with us. Um, but this is a very important topic, especially for our community. We, we actually have some some parents that are that are in the chat right now um, and parents who've, who've lost their children to gun violence here uh, in the, the city of Seattle and across King County. Um, and I know your office, the, the police does a lot of the investigative stuff. Your office does some as well. But just to the parents who are actually watching right now on here with, with the King County prosecutor, do you have any words for them? Well, first of all, I'm sorry. It is, it is the hardest thing that any parent could do would be lose a child in any fashion. And to lose a child to senseless gun violence has got to be the hardest thing ever. And I've met with a lot of families who've suffered this and they, it's a, it's, it's irrevocable. It's, it is grief that won't go away. And it, and, and it's shared, um, every day, you know, there's, there's a, there's new members of this, this club that nobody wants to belong to someone who lost a loved one to gun violence. Uh, we need to stand up and say, this is not okay. And we need to start working on the areas that, uh, where we can give hope to young people. So they don't think that there's, they're destined to just carry guns and just shoot at other people. Then, you know, and that's, that is a, an entire community conversation. And, and it's, but it starts with having some trusted members of the community step in to, to places where nobody else wants to go right now. And we, we, de we need, definitely need more uh, community um, liaisons and violence interrupters, particularly in our, in our Latinx community and with, and with uh, you know, the children of recent immigrants. And, you know, there's a lot of areas that we haven't, we haven't, uh, been able to reach into as a community, but you know the the parents who've lost children that should be our motivating factor to do better uh, and to not just respond. I mean that's what my office unfortunately mostly we respond after a tragedy. We we hold people accountable. We you know take cases to trial and do the things that prosecutors do. But so much of this work has to be before all of that happens. It really has to start with with young people, children in elementary school, to teach them how to de-escalate themselves. Uh, you know, we talk about de-escalation for police, and that's really important. But we all need to understand that that violence and anger is a neurochemical response. It's, you know, there's actual cortisol that's tr going through the the brain, and it's making people feel like they have it's a fight or flight syndrome. And they, if they've got a gun, then all of a sudden this this tense and angry moment becomes a deadly confrontational moment. So we need to teach us all how to step away, how to walk away from a situation like that and, and, and learn to live another day. So it's, it's, um, it's heartbreaking. And I'm, I'm so sorry uh, that people are suffering this and continue to suffer it. And we, like I say, we've had in the, over the last weekend, uh, you know, another five, six homicides uh, that have happened uh, and it, it's preventable and it's, it's reversible. I mean, it's, it's irreversible, but it's, it's something that we should be concerned about as a public health issue. And you see, you hear that said all the time that the gun violence is a public health issue. Well, it is because it's preventable in the same way that, the, you know, COVID can be prevented by a vaccine. Gun violence can be prevented by investments in the communities where this uh, is disproportionately um, tearing apart families and, and destroying lives. Yeah. Right on. Um, King County Prosecutor Satterberg, I want to thank you for taking time with us this morning, um, you know, for taking time out of your schedule, because we wanted to actually have a real in-depth conversation. Um, and, you know, I mean, thanks for getting the information out there, and, and hopefully we can keep this discussion going. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Bye.
man, you know, it's like the one thing about this, the data, the data gives a lot of insight. And, you know, what he was, was talking about, I talked to him with, about that uh, last time, is that everybody's tracking all this data, whether it's over there at the prosecutor, whether it's up at Harborview, whether it's public health, ZYD, and they're able to target in. And I'm telling you that the actual number of people, there's some stuff that's just like, just, you know, random, totally random but a lot of this violence that impacts our community, man, it's a it's a relatively small number of people, and it all touches. And what he said though is is true of what the data says. If if you know somebody who's been shot, it raises the chances of you yourself being shot. Yeah, this is exactly the work that's been happening on the ground and, and from a community perspective as well, is identifying uh, the potential uh, young folks who may be involved in these acts of violence. And I remember being startled hearing these numbers and, and hearing that it, it boils down to maybe like 50 people, right? And there's this like this very serious uh, nucleus of folks that are involved. It's insane, man. Yeah, so we're going to take a quick break right now. This is a big show today, um, and we're going to be back with um, State Senator uh, Joe Wynn, who's also running for uh, King County Executive, the executive position, and also uh, um, his office just released a, a statement regarding gun violence going on. And, you know, I got a handcrafted motion graphic. You know what I'm saying? You know, I worked hard on this, man. You got you to put that up. There it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I get up early in the morning to make those. You're watching the Morning Update Show. Hey, everybody. We all know that COVID-19 has had a major impact on everything this year, even energy bills. Puget Sound Energy understands the ongoing struggle that's facing its customers. And this is why they're offering a COVID bill assistance program of up to $2,500 per qualified customer. If you or anyone you know are currently behind on energy bills, please contact PSC today to discuss all of the assistance options available. Visit psc.com forward slash COVID to learn more. Hey, it's me, downtown Seattle, C-Town. Wish you were here. Here to explore inside, outside, and everywhere in between where it's easy to get my good side. Here, where my rooftops invite you to come early and stay late. Where every view is a postcard and each night out might be your best night ever. See you soon. Love, C-Town. All right. You, you know that's Gifted Gab right there, right? Yeah, there we go. I knew I recognized that voice. Yeah, you know Love, C-Town. Mm -hmm. This is wild. All right. Welcome back to more an update show on this very serious uh, topic uh, around gun violence. You know, here at convert. We said we were going to stick to it. You know what I'm saying? And it's a lot of ups and downs and emotion around this. And, and you won't I won't even bring it up here on air. But, you know, it's the, con the continuous impact uh, even for, for us guys um, here, you know, reporting on it, going back to the neighborhood, talking to people impacted by it. You go to the restaurant, you see somebody crying about it. You know what I'm saying? You go over. I mean, it's this is it's it's all it's all in. But look, let's let's uh, bring in somebody who says that he has a plan around gun violence. This is State Senator Joe Wynn. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, Hi, welcome Hi, back to the Morning Update Show. How are you? I appreciate. It. Well, hopefully, sometime soon we can come back for celebratory reasons and not necessarily just tough topics like this as well. But first of all, I just want to acknowledge the trauma, like you said, has happened. Gun violence is a public health crisis and each and every shooting is a tragedy for those in fact impacted, but also our communities as well. So I appreciate you covering. Yeah, no, no doubt. And for, for people where well, you said celebratory is this because running for, for uh King County executive position. All right. So we, we're, we're cleared the path for you here. We've got you in, in as long as it takes here because you put out this release and you said it's about um, disruption of gun violence. And so because of that, we want to give you space so we can hear what it is that you're talking about. The floor yeah, is yours. I appreciate it. And, and you even mentioned it the data, right? We know that gun violence exists in pockets of poverty and spikes where people are undersourced. And as a county and as a society, we focus too much on incarceration instead of prevention. And even last week, you saw uh, the incumbent and also Mayor Durkin announced that they're going to invest $2 million in community organizations in this space. 
But if you compare that with what the county just approved, $42 million. So two versus $42 million for the backlog in our criminal legal system, right? We focus on our incarceration facilities, not on prevention. And that shows where our values are. I think council member Jeremiah Zahalai was the only no vote on that effort. Uh, but we should be funding peace and violence intervention efforts. And if you look at other jurisdictions, we have examples of other places who are doing this. Uh, California is spending $43 billion on violence intervention, specifically in Sacramento County, it's $301 million. Tennessee spending $6.3 billion. In Shelby County, they're doing $182 million. In Florida, right, Florida, $17.6 billion. In Hillsborough County, they're spending $286 million in this effort uh, compared to the $2 million that we're looking at right now. We can't just do enough for headlines. We actually have to solve the problems as well. And you mentioned zero youth detention. We can't get to zero youth detention without addressing the culture of gun violence specifically. I think there are 19 youths who are in our facilities right now. Most of them are related to, to gun uh, charges. We need to make systemic investments. And this is, this is holistic. I know that this is not easy, but in workforce and economic development. Did you know that King County, despite being the 12th largest county in the nation, doesn't have an office of economic development? We should be funding our education system. We need to have access to healthy foods, more affordable housing, quality primary and health care, especially mental health. We need to have affordable, reliable public transit. And what's interesting is that if you look at the data, uh, having uh, nature, being nearby nature alleviates uh, gun violence as well. And, and if you look at what the county can do specifically, there's no agency in the county that oversees community centers or coordinating support for them. Even the Youth Achievement Center uh that that's being constructed right now that was community funded and not necessarily through the county so that's just one example so our goal should be having a community that is safe for all people especially our kids young people should be able to run around and play in the streets uh but that requires everyone to come together to work collaboratively and you should be able to thrive despite your zip code right and we have to address the root causes of what's happening or else we're just going to come back and have the same conversation again so what we are doing right now is we're continuing to divest and increase fragmentation in our communities. We're throwing scraps here and there performatively to alleviate guilt, but we need to be investing in our people. So who should be in charge of caring for the young people that we have in our community, right? Community can be doing so much, but we need our elected officials to step up as well. So under investing in our communities is frustrating and it's been happening for too long. And that's why we need leaders who will prioritize our efforts in this space. And this is all stuff that we've talked about for decades. Communities have been fighting for this for decades. And this is not the only example. The youth jail is one, too, where the county and the region have perpetually been late on issues that the community has been fighting for decades to address. So what we need to do is uplift the voices of the people in our community who are fighting for change, who have proven solutions, who are doing the work, and ensuring that we scale them up to match the crisis that we are in right now. Um, wow. And that's really, that's really the work. It's not going to be easy. But it also requires us to, to work together to actually get this done. Now, you know what, Joe? I mean, you really are right on this. And I think um, steeping it in that data is really important for us to understand when we look at King County as the 12th largest county in the nation, and yet our investments are not shaping up to that. What are some of the things that you think people need in terms of, you know, wake up calls? I feel like, you know, us seeing this increase in violence, that should be a wake up call enough to really identify this as a public health crisis and give it the investment it needs. What more can be done in this issue to kind of wake us up and shake up this county so that we're doing these things from a county level yep. and not just focusing on what cities are doing in their own silos. Yeah, no, you know, as somebody who is from White Center, these are issues we've been dealing with for a long time. And I'll be just perfectly honest with you. I'm tired of trying to convince people that these issues are important because they've been important for our communities. At this point, I demand that our elected officials actually pay attention and prioritize these efforts as well. And that's why in the legislature, I fought so hard for anti-poverty efforts, done so much of criminal justice reform, but really the county needs to step up. And instead of just talking about change, needs to act. So you're right, we do need to raise awareness in the community, but to be perfectly honest, we need our leaders to step up as well.
Yeah, I think that that's where we definitely see a, a void. And I think so many people in community speak about this void often. Um, you know, it's interesting because ultimately, I think a lot of people are saying, you know what, we've had so much energy that's been poured into this from a community perspective, but it does take a holistic approach. And community can only do so much if they don't have the support of the county, of the state, of other environments that are going to bring in more resources to like you said, scale up all of the solutions that we know work. I mean, just a minute ago, we were talking about credible messengers, right? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, people have to understand that these are the people that are on the ground every day building relationships. Our elected officials don't do that, but they have to support them. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you, Omari. Yeah, I, I want to throw this out there because, you know, I've had an opportunity. Actually, I was just with uh, Executive Constantine and Mayor Durkin uh, before the show. There's a, a homeless um, uh a structure that's being built like two blocks from our studio. But I've had an opportunity now to talk to Executive Constantine quite a few times over the last few weeks on this issue here around gun violence. And I'll throw you the same question um, that, that I threw him was that how do you get people in the county to care? See, what you're talking about is you're talking about investment. You're saying that investment needs to happen and we need to be able to shift the way that we think about some things. And you've offered examples in, in, in uh, Sacramento and down there in Shelby County and in Florida. But for, for that to happen with that amount of money and the money investment here, it's going to take buy in. And right here, even in the city of Seattle, we struggle every day to try to make people care. Um, you know, and, and for people to look beyond their fiefdoms here, there's seven little individual fiefdoms that, that make up uh, the city of Seattle with these seven districts that we have here. It's difficult to even get people to care in the municipality. How are you planning to get buy in across the county if you're elected to be able to get the people behind the reallocation of these resources um, that, that you've described that you say are required to see the changes that you want to see? Yeah, there's a couple of things. First off, so oftentimes the communities most impacted by bad policies or these types of situations are then tasked with fixing them as well. And that perpetuates inequities because it is exhausting to have to deal with these issues, but also have to be in charge of fixing them. The first thing we need to do is making sure that we uplift and amplify the voices of those in the community so that the folks who are fighting for change are in fact being heard. We've seen a strong coalition working in this space, whether it was the no youth jail, uh, whether it's investing in the youth achievement center, there are people who care. There are people who, out, who are out there doing the work. So instead of them fighting to make sure that they're being heard, we should be uplifting and amplifying them as well. And it, it is oftentimes top down. So if our leadership isn't prioritizing this, there's no wonder that it's not necessarily out in the zeitgeist of the community uh, in terms of their understanding of this situation. I happen to be from an area that is uh, subject to gun violence, and that's why I personally care about this particular issue. And we have to be telling those stories and uplifting those voices as well. So I do think, I do think people care. The problem is, I think that the people who care are oftentimes being limited by the current structure that we are in as well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword where we want to uplift the people doing the work, but also knowledge that they're also impacted by it. So for me, I think people care. It's incumbent upon the leaders that we have right now to push that message forward. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right about that. I think for some people um, here, when they hear it from uh, sometimes uh, the elected officials' voice, it, it permeates differently. And yeah. that's kind of what I mean in terms of it being driven by so many folks in community that, you know, oftentimes they feel like, okay, that's not affecting my lived experience. But I think right. so much of this is about painting the picture for them yeah. to understand how it is affecting their lived experience. And that right there, I think, is the central point between it becoming something that is just being dealt with in an urban environment or with those people that are different than me and it becoming something that is like nah man this is a public health crisis we need to see yeah. it as such yeah you have something else well yeah because so you we hit on a good point here and i actually want to clarify something that the the people of the emerald city have a big heart and yeah. we, we see when it comes to giving it's very good people that live here. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times we're, we're, we're pulled apart on specific issues, but this is a good city with good yeah. people and caring people. So I didn't want to infer that the people don't care. Really what I'm saying is how do we get politics? You know, like you have to have I, the yeah, best no, I, yeah, The right thing right. is COVID, why, why everybody did so well on COVID was from the governor all the way down to the dog catcher. Everybody was on the same message. 
Yeah. Everybody was on the same message, 100%. But, you know, I mean, and that took city council members, county council members who might be on different political spectrums coming together on the message, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's really more of my point is like, one, here here in the city of Seattle, and we got a lot of parents that are that are here in the chat right now, they'll tell you that they're hearing death being silenced. When it, when it comes to, to the, the murders and the gun violence that's occurring here in the Emerald City and, and across the county. And, and even there's been a lot of silence on the county council. Council member Gurmai Zahalai, you know, of course, he's been very vocal. There's been a few others, but it's a lot of people on the council. You know, they've been mum. Um, you know, and, and that being said, what the impact of that is, is the normalization. When we talk about, I, I bring this up often, at Emerson Elementary, 70 gunshots fired. Everybody should be appalled. Every elected official mm -hmm. should be on the same message. Like, man, this is not okay in our city. This is not okay in our county. These murders that just occurred here, people should be on the same mm -hmm. page. We go back last year, some of the, the, the murders that, that, we, that we've covered here, uh, Lorenzo Anderson Jr., uh, Connor Dasa Holland, so many others, like, and again and again, and we have, it's been silent in this mm -hmm. city. It's been absolutely silent. I'm sorry to sit here and go on a rant. I know your time is short, no, but I mean, it's. I think that the challenge that we see is one, it's not how you make the people to Emerald City or Martin Luther King County care. How do we get these elected officials who are sitting there, who use their platform to fundraise and do all these other things to use their platform to be on message on this one, to address the humanity, the impacts of humanity around gun violence, and two, to get on message and care to work to disrupt gun violence. Well, I mean, you nailed it. I think I think you actually just answered your question. The fact that Gramai Zahala is the only African American council member, I think, in the entire Washington state. And the fact that he's fighting for these issues shows how important representation is in our elected officials. What I've learned in my time in politics is that uh, it's not actually about good or bad, right or wrong, even Democrat or Republican. It's about making sure that your issue is worthy of being discussed and being prioritized. And for so long, our issues have not been. But yet we've now seen some of the most diverse legislative bodies in the history of Washington state, whether it's the state, the councils or even other levels. And we're seeing people start to push for policies that actually impact our communities. It's not happening fast enough, but I've seen it happen in the legislature, and I believe it can happen at the county as well. I'm running literally for that reason, is to make sure the voices who've been marginalized for too long, who've been underinvested for too long, are actually at the table getting the investments they need to get this done. Because the people, like you say, in Emerald City, we do care. We need our leaders with the political will to actually get things done. You know, uh, absolutely, we do. And I think that, you know, lastly, I, I just want to say here that, you know, we look at the demographics, right? I hear what you're talking about. And when we look at the demographics of King County, you know, we understand that a lot of times it's people that are voting for people that it seems as though they have their best interests at heart. So some of these elected officials staying quiet, um, unfortunately, is a part of what they that some of their constituents want for them. So I think it's a both and approach. And I just yep. wanted to be able to address that because I think that partially we also have folks that are like, hey, I live in an area and this doesn't bother me. I live over. Hey, that's over there. It's not really my issue. And I need my elected official to not really say too much because it's not really what we're dealing with over here. So I think you're right that and Omar is very right about making sure that our elected officials care. So thank you so much, Joanne, for your passion. Yeah on this issue and for putting out that statement it's important that we get folks to really at the at those elected official official levels to yeah. care and we do need diversity all throughout all of these uh areas that matter to us and this is why we've been pumping this election being so important because yeah. we need diversity we need diverse voices no excuses this is why yeah. we've been pumping our song no excuses man you know what i'm saying it's election season here and and for for me you know i'm we don't tell people who to vote for over here, like a lot of other media outlets or, you know, they're endorsing this person or that person. But I do know that, like, this is no excuses season for us. And, yep. man, and people who've been quiet on issues that are impacting our community, you know, yeah. <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll see how it goes. Now, Silence is deafening. Yeah, real, real quick, um, you know, it came on the radar, radar here today. You're having, a uh, before we let you go, we're ha you're having a press conference tomorrow, right? Yeah, we're doing it at the administration building. All right. And, and you're you're also you're tomorrow you're laying out a lot of the stuff that we you discussed here today as well. Yeah, exactly. And what's you know, 
what's frustrating is that a lot of the stuff that we're saying is not new and it's not even transformative. It's just doing the work that the community has said is going to work for a long time. And addressing gun violence solves a whole host of other issues as well, right? We're talking affordable housing, access to healthcare, community centers, things like that. These things uplift all of our communities. That's how we get things done. So by addressing the, the root causes, addresses so many other symptoms in our society as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, State Senator Joe Wynn, candidate for King County Executive. Thank you for taking the time with us this morning. Last minute. I thought it was important when I saw that press release go out. I was like, you know what? If you're talking about uh, gun violence disruption, let me get you on air right now. So thank you for being nimble and coming it. on air with us. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Have a good day. Thank you again for having right. me. Yep. Absolutely. Trey Holiday. Yeah. I mean, this is the 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 issues we keep on talking about. And to be honest, um, you know, I think that when I talk about being in a transformative time, so much is it is a, is about representation and the fact that we have so many different folks that are bringing their lived experience into this candidacy, into these races. That's important because exactly what he was talking about there. We need to hear these messages coming from those offices, coming from those elected elected officials and their administration we need to hear that you know c concentrated message as you said everybody's saying saying the same thing that's where a lot of times people who have been a little bit remiss of the issue are like oh well that's not really my issue they start to pay more attention so i just I, i'm really appreciating the fact that this race is giving us the opportunity to inject that diversity that's so needed yeah well you know um i just it's crazy that that we sit here and we have a discussion about <clears throat> how so many people are so quiet on things life or death. And I mean, you know, Prosecutor Satterberg, he broke it down because it's like there's there's a reason for people and in, in politicians to care no matter what, even if they're not concerned about us per se as people hopefully they are but of course there's there's the the violence the impact of violence impact on community and everything else there's the economic cost you know it's very expensive like i said and then there's also people who's like man property value maybe that's what you're into you know maybe you're into real estate is this bringing down a property value is it bringing down whatever there's so many different things that you would hope that it didn't have to go that far but you know i mean when people look at this issue but it's just it's just kind of mind boggling to me that, that we can't we can do so many amazing things in this city, but we can't get all of our electeds on the same page. And you know what? <clears throat> the thing is, is y'all can't run and hide because we seen you all work together on messaging around COVID. See, it'd be different if there was no blueprint, Trey Holiday. We'd be like, ah, we've never seen these guys on messaging. We seen y'all all fall in the line around COVID. So don't say it can't be done. Don't say political ideology or this and that or anything else. We saw you guys gave us an outstanding example and one of the very best in America as detailed there by the New York Times and everything else, how the political ecosystem here of elected officials work together in an amazing way to combat COVID-19. I would say this down there at city council and over there across the street at county council, you know, elected officials and appointed officials, man, we're just looking for part two. We've seen you do it in part one around COVID. Let's all get on message here around gun violence. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. And I think that it's so important um, that we eradicate this issue and and really take it to heart. It's it's a both and approach, a holistic approach, not just the investments, not just the care, not just the voices, but all of it together, you know, and really learning from the families, uh, being able to center them in all of this work. Because as we said here, they've been hearing silence, definitely silence. And it's important that we start to change all of those dynamics to change this entire situation. Yeah, and if I get one more email from anybody out who's running for office and you talk about you raising money, and you ain't sent out no email or no messaging or shown no concern or hug no mama or nothing around this gun violence issue. 
We might just have to put some of his emails up on the screen. There we go. You know what I'm saying? This is a perfect opportunity right now. Remove me from your email list. Do not be emailing me asking for campaign funds and everything else because clearly your campaign doesn't impact the issues that impact me. We're going to take a quick break to clear the air because, you know, my mama says we can't never leave the show, in the show, uh, leaving people in, in an affected state. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. The morning update show is going back on the road, and this time we're headed to Seattle's iconic Paramount Theater. Join me, Trey Holiday, and the rest of the morning update show crew, August 2nd through August 6th, as we broadcast live from one of Seattle's most iconic landmarks and put a focus on the arts, culture, and music right here in the Emerald City. That's the morning update show live from the Paramount Theater, August 2nd through August 6th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., streaming across all Converge media platforms. All right, welcome back to the Morning Update Show. And, and, you know, today's show, if you haven't tagged or shared today's show yet, I want to man, tell you to do this. is a very informative show um, with Prosecutor Satterberg, State Senator Joe Wynn. Um, you know, a really good discussion around topics that are important. So want to invite you to tag and share the stream. Let's let's get this one out here. Let's, let's really put it out there. But Trey Holiday, all next week, we're at the iconic Paramount Theater. Yeah, I mean, so beautiful just being in there again and remembering um, the architecture that it took to build such a iconic space uh, in our city. Really excited to be there. Oh, I can't wait to be bringing some guests on um, and to be in that historic space, man. Converge. We get to the Paramount, baby. Yo, big shout out to to the big fella, Jake Grabbright. This is why you guys need to get him to 10,000. You know, Jake shot that commercial, put it put it all together. And I think we're going to put up some of the other visuals from that shoot uh, later on today. So I'm you know, I'm excited and and for a lot of reasons. And we'll we'll talk about it on Monday. We're going to be sitting down with the, um, the CEO over there at Seattle Theater Group. And, you know, on that Thursday, Stephanie Johnson Tolliver is going to join us. And we're going to talk about the history of of black entertainment and black entertainers here in in Seattle. She's going back over 100 some odd years and and some everything else. And we got a bunch of surprise artists that are going to be joining us at the Paramount as well. Yeah, so excited, man. I think we have such a vibrant city and so many knowledgeable people. I'm glad that they'll be joining us next week at the Paramount. Yeah. And, you know, tomorrow's our last day here in this studio. Um, and I, I was just thinking, and before we get out of here, is like uh, what we're gonna do with with these photos. So, our, in our new studio, these these photos won't be there, and so maybe our our audience might have some ideas of what we could do. Almost all of these are Jake Grabbrot photos as well. There's a few here that that are not, but um, what should we do with these photos? You know, because they're not gonna be. I mean, and you guys, when when you see the new studio. You're going to really see what the five dollar army and the five dollar family is capable of. I mean, the new the new studio is is pretty dope. So we we solicit your ideas on, on these because these are these are the authentic photos, you know, that are here on the wall in our studio. Um, so but uh, we're, we're over time, but in a good way. What a great yeah. show. Trey Holiday, before we get out of here, any last words? Uh, you know, last words for me, stay consistent. You guys, you know, see yourself as part of the solution. We're dealing with a lot of different things that need a lot of different voices. And it's clear that when we have diversity, we actually create solutions that affect and benefit so many more people. So please find yourself as a part of an amazing solution out there. If there's something not working in your area, be the one to fix it. Find yourself as a part of the solution. All right. Uh, programming notes tonight at seven o'clock is clap back culture with Julia, Jesse and Mike Davis of the South Seattle Emerald. And good old Cuddy is going to be directed that way, too. You know, Cuddy put his he put his uh, vote commercial on his personal Instagram. <laughs> oh, my God. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? This guy got fans, man. <laughs> on that, want to remind everybody as well. Man, vote. Vote, vote. These issues that we're talking about right here, you know, a lot of them, the first step starts right there at the ballot box. And, they, man, these votes count. You know what I'm saying? Don't sit this one out. We need you guys to vote. Um, on that note, and we'll go what there, man, you're on point, Cuddy. Want to remind everybody, or matter of fact, want to encourage everybody to go forward in your purpose, go forward in your humanity, and until tomorrow at 11 a.m., peace. peace. Lift every voice and
Rising the rising sun. 